Welcome everyone. This is such a timely topic. We're so glad you joined us. So the pandemic has affected everyone's mental health, but no group has suffered as much as our youth at a time when they, they need their village, they need their peers and other caregivers and teachers. And for many of them, therapists and all of that, all of those supports of course have been, um, been wrenched away for the last year and a half, at least in person. And what we know from the statistics is that the mental health of youth has taken a nosedive. For example, in 2020, when there was less prevention and treatment, kids ended up in the ER with crises, with suicidality. And there was a 31% increase in psychiatric emergencies in the ER for teens. We worried a lot about the elderly and a, survey, a CDC survey showed that, um, yes, it's been hard, of course, for people um, who are living alone, but the, the mental, they have more mental health resilience than our youth. And the statistics are quite dramatic. So for example, in 2020, those over 65, only 2% had suicidality in the last month. When we look at our youth, our Gen X, 25% had considered suicide in the last month. So this is, um, this is a time now in 2021 that parents are asking, what are the long-term effects? How can I protect my child? How can I bolster them as they go back to school? Parents themselves, of course, are strained. So you don't need statistics. You know what's been happening at home. And many parents have written in asking about how can, how can I protect my child from my own worries and, and stress? So the general question I'm gonna ask our panelists is, is really how can we best support our youth right now at this time as they transition back to school before and during? So let me uh, introduce our amazing panelists. We're just so happy to have you with us. Why don't you, you can all come back on screen. We have Julie Lithgott Hames, a uh, former corporate lawyer, a former Stanford Dean, a New York Times bestselling author of several books, a very in-demand speaker. We're so glad you joined us, Julie. She's the author of How to Raise an Adult. And she is now the author of another book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult which is about true inclusion, creating environments when anyone with any differences can feel welcomed, respected, supported, valued, and be their authentic self. That sounds really good, Julie. I think we all need to read this book. I'm so happy to bring you Dan Siegel, who knows needs no introduction for this group. He, he has helped sponsor our webinar last year and has um, been speaking to us throughout the pandemic on various topics. He's a professor, clinical professor at UCLA, founder of Mindsight Institute, um, author of many best-selling books, including The Developing Brain, The Whole Brain Child, and the recent parenting book, The Power of Showing Up, about uh, presence and other ways of supporting our children. We have Joyce Dorado. Joyce, well, wonderful to see you. Joyce is a professor here at UCSF as well as me. And she has a phenomenal line of work working with schools. She's the director of the UCSF Health Environments and Response to Trauma in Schools. We'll hear, we're, we will hear more about her program. Her work is just vital at this point because it's the systems, it's taking care of teachers and helping with trauma-informed responses. That is gonna be so critical this next month. And last week, we have Sonia Luthar. Welcome, Sonia. Sonia is a emeritus professor at Columbia. She is uh, an, a renowned research, researcher on child resilience, including resilience to both trauma and also to parent per excessive parental pressure to succeed. Thanks, uh, Alyssa. I will share my screen. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So what I'm going to talk about today is this notion of resilience, which is to start with a quick definition, is the process of doing well in the face of tra trauma or adversity, which God knows we've all experienced a great deal of in the last 14, 15 months. Important thing to remember, resilience is not a personality trait, not something you either have or don't have. It's simply doing well in spite of difficult life circumstances. 
Um, so the big question, the question of the day is, how can we best help children to maintain resilient adaptation as they go back to school uh, in the next month or so? Um, most important, uh, if you want to help at the population level and do prevention as opposed to coming in at the tail end when problems have developed, understand the nature and the degree of mental health issues in a given school district or a given school, carefully quantifying the nature of problems, or depression, anxiety, rule breaking, substance use, uh, which are the groups that are most vulnerable, as well as the drivers of well being. In other words, the risk and protective factors, the safety nets that will help boost well being in a particular community. Uh, so that's my part one and part two is tending to those who take care of the children. Critical, and I'll explain more as I go along. So uh, Lisa talked a bit about adults' uh, mental health, and there have been several reports, including one from APA on stress in America on the well-being of uh, adults. Uh, our group, we've been studying uh, adolescents mostly, but little ones as well. And here's some data for you, uh, just tracking what we've seen in rates of clinically serious significant depression and anxiety. What we saw, uh, this is uh, high schoolers. This is when the pandemic hit around, uh, in, this is 2020. So we saw initial drops in serious depression and anxiety, followed by, as you see, steady increases over time. And this was our last set of assessments um, uh, we're at about 11%, more than one in 10 of kids reporting serious anxiety and about 10% reporting um, significant depression. So this is a, across these 41,000 kids who were assessed during the pandemic. This is what we saw. In other words, things are getting more, uh, I'm probably not, not surprising, uh, more difficult for our young ones. Um, the uh, part two to this is not just see at, the, at the whole level uh, who's vulnerable, but also specifics within schools. So this is just some sample data from one school to help illustrate the point. Uh, across schools, you see this group in particular, non gender non-binary kids. It's a small number in absolute terms, but you can see the huge vulnerability compared to the black lines are national norms, averages across the country. So typically we'll see serious symptoms among gender non-binary kids, regardless of part of country, public, private school, that are at least twice the rates in either males or females. Now in this particular school, as an example, it was seniors that were much above the uh, normative rate uh, for that grade level. Uh, in other schools, it, it's been you know, the transition you're going into the freshman year or, or seniors. As well as ethnicity in this particular school, it happened to be the multiracial kids in particular who were struggling more so than other groups who are traditionally we think of as being more quote at risk for um, discrimination and so on and so forth. So being able to get the uh, basically characterize the school as a whole, how are we doing, get a report card and then get to the subgroups by by gender, grade, as to say, by two, two ways of uh, breaking them down, you see, which are the subgroups that are that are struggling the most that we need to attend to? Um, oh yeah, the source here is uh, authcon.com. That's all of our research is, uh, on schools is published by white papers and so on. What are the important drivers of mental health? What we found is that three aspects of kids' lives most strongly linked with mental health. No surprise here, relationships with parents, including, and Alyssa mentioned this too, worry about parents' well-being, as well as anxiety, attention in the home, um, anger, irritability. Just a couple of examples of what the kinds of things we've heard kids saying in their open-ended responses. They talk about fights with their parents, disappointing them, uh, getting on their nerves, uh, getting parents sick or grandparents sick. And also there were uh, kids, kids would talk about, I don't want to have a breakdown in front of my parents and make things even more worrisome for them, which is a lot for a child obviously to be carrying around. Number two, emotional support from adults was hugely important. And uh, if, right from the uh, get-go when the pandemic first hit and learning efficacy, feeling like they could learn school materials. This is just an example of the kind of things they're saying, love the support from my teachers and uh, advisors, especially when I'm stressed or anxious, they're understanding, they're empathic. And it's, it's lovely to see this, that the efforts that educators are making are going somewhere and really are, um, are very beneficial to uh, students. 
At the same time, these, these findings are a little worrisome to me, both this one as well as the emotional support from school adults. Why? Because parents do not show that dip and then rise again or dip and stabilizing in mental health trouble. If anything, their distress and stress levels have gone up over time. Um, and we have also studied K through 12 uh, faculty and staff over the last 14 months, about 8,000 people across the country. Rates of, again, serious burnout, exhaustion at work. We started out at one in five uh, last year about this time, uh, or in April, and this has climbed to over 30% now. So one in three, basically, starting the semester, I would think, at serious levels of emotional exhaustion. Um, this is the kind of thing we're hearing now that I've not been so scared throughout the pandemic as I am right now. I feel like I've got nothing to give. Um, Attending to important caregiving adults. Uh, so what we know now is if, for kids to be doing well, the incontrovertible fact is that we need to have the, uh, people who take care of them doing well. This is a take home message from this report, consensus study report from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine from 2019. Most important thing, again, I'll say it one more time, if you want kids to do well and in the face of any adversity, you want their primary caregivers to be doing well. How do we do that? As with children, as children need ongoing supports, resilience rests on relationships fundamentally, so do the adults who take care of them. So as I mentioned this, we've been doing uh, very much community-based uh, groups to support um, various groups of caregivers. So this was the first clinical trial we did, um, which was authentic connections groups for moms who were physicians, MPs and PAs at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Um, one hour sessions for three months on the Mayo Clinic campus and uh, they had free time to attend their groups. Saw substantial improvements in distress, stress, emotional exhaustion, burnout, as well as in cortisol with the uh, gains, not just sustained, but actually improvements uh, seen in the follow-up uh, stages. Um, after that, we did another study at uh, the headquarters of Mayo with nurse leaders. Once again, we saw similar improvements and uh, fascinating, there were zero dropouts in both of these trials. So that really speaks to the enormous need I mean, you all know, many of you know, physicians and healthcare providers in general are high risk of burnout. The need for having this kind of support for people and obviously multiplied by many uh, for right now, uh, given COVID. Um, fortuitously, before COVID, I had tested about five sets of groups virtually, uh, and we basically found them to be both feasible and successful. And during COVID, did many of them with educators, counselors, healthcare providers, again, across the country. Uh, the kind of thing that the physicians and nurses and counselors are saying, it's a chance to, for us to be taken care of, uh, to be held accountable in getting support for ourselves, rather than just saying focused on endlessly giving to others, which obviously is a huge commitment among uh, all these people to be doing for others, bringing this to the forefront, taking care of them. An upstream approach to taking care of our children, make sure that those who take care of them, whether it's parents or clinicians or physicians, uh, make sure that all these people are doing well. And that's the sum and substance of what I have to say. Our publications are on acgroups.org or uh, authcon.com. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's such an honor to be on this panel. I'd like to bring a trauma-informed healing-centered lens to this conversation. Because of the collective trauma of the pandemic, most of us, including our youth, have been experiencing something akin to a steady IV drip of stress neurochemicals for 18 months now. And this can cause wear and tear on our brains and our bodies. So that's the bad news. But the good news is there are protective factors that can help mitigate these effects and that we can provide to our young people as they go back to school this fall. So John, could you show the slide, please? Our program, HEARTS, partners with schools here in the Bay Area and across the country to help educators understand how trauma can affect any of us as human beings. And we offer approaches and strategies for mitigating these effects that anybody, regardless of their role in the school, can implement. And our work is guided by these principles, which are all grounded in the science of trauma and healing and resilience. You can check them out on our website. We offer these principles as goalposts to aim for and as lenses through which educators and other adults can examine what they do, helping them to ask questions like, are our practices and policies trauma-inducing or trauma-reducing? So moving into our first principle, 
understanding how trauma and chronic stress affects our brains and bodies can help us as adults more effectively support our young people. So it's good to know, for example, that humans, we as humans are hardwired to respond to danger by going into survival mode, <gasps> fight, flight, or freeze, right? And when we're in this mode, the thinking part of our brain largely goes offline and the survival brain of our part of our brain takes over. And this actually helps us to survive if we're actually in danger. But unfortunately, because we've been chronically under threat here with, um, with COVID, for example, our survival mode neural networks are constantly firing. And because neurons that fire together a lot get wired together more strongly, our survival mode, mode neural networks get wired up so strongly that they end up being like overactive alarm systems on a hair trigger. So put simplistically and figuratively, it's like trauma wears a fear groove or a survival mode rut into our brain that we're more easily knocked into. And this means that depending upon our trauma experiences, certain trauma reminders like loud sounds or feeling put down or silenced or helpless, or during these pandemic times, someone lightly coughing can trigger us into survival mode, even when we're not in actual danger. So in the context of school, when a young person gets triggered into survival brain, it becomes nearly impossible to learn academic material. Instead, they might get aggressive, that's fight, or run out of the class, that's flee, or be unresponsive to directives, that's freeze. So to best support our young people, it's important to recognize that these kinds of behaviors may well be fear responses, not rude or willfully defiant responses, or otherwise we end up punishing kids for being in survival mode and being harmful to, to them instead of being helpful. So here's another tip aligned with this principle. As you've described earlier in this series, Alyssa, quick physiological breaks throughout the day can help our bodies metabolize stress neurochemicals and prevent those toxic neurochemicals from building up in our bodies and making us sick. So we can metabolize stress through physical activity. And so if we create opportunities for physical activity breaks throughout the day, stretching, running around on the playground, this can actually help our kids stay healthy. We can also metabolize stress neurochemicals through breath work. So we can teach our kids that deep breaths in which the exhale is longer than the inhale helps to calm our bodies down, right? This helps us get our thinking learning brains to come back online and metabolize the otherwise toxic neurochemicals of chronic stress. And a way to teach this even to little kids is to have them blow on a pinwheel like this. So you can see something like blow on this until you can make it, so you can make it go around as long as you can. I'm gonna demonstrate. That long, slow exhale, it actually helped me just now. So we're gonna lean now into our cultural humility and equity principle. So we understand now that societal oppressions like racism, xenophobia, and homophobia can be trauma-inducing in and of themselves. It's that looming and all too often concrete threat that one person's safety, one's life, is not as important as that of another person's due to the lottery of birth the color of one's skin, where one was born, who one loves. So attending to racial justice and equity needs to be central to supporting young people's transition back to school this fall. We strongly believe that if, for example, a practice or a policy is not racially just, it's not trauma-informed. And we have a real opportunity to make progress along these lines given the landscape created by the racial justice uprising from last summer. And in fact, if educators don't continue to name and address structural racism in this coming year, it could make black and brown students, families and colleagues feel like, what? Even after everything that's happening, this, this isn't important. We must not matter much to this school. And of course that's extremely harmful. And backing off of our anti-racist practices isn't good for white kids either, white youth either, because I mean, what message does it give them about the intrinsic worth of their black and brown peers if we, their trusted adults, backslide on our racial justice efforts at this point. So moving on to safety and predictability, we need to create and maintain not just physical safety, but also relational safety for our young people, making sure that they know we will care for them and protect them from harm no matter what, even when we're frustrated with them. And because triggered dysregulated behavior can cause unsafety, we can bolster emotional safety by building our young people's stress management skills as well as our own. Moving to our compassion and dependability principle. Here's the thing, chronic stress and trauma can be toxic, but love, love is the medicine. So as you, Dan, have so powerfully described, we're hardwired for connection with caring others to help us calm down when we're stressed out, to keep resilient in the face of adversity and to heal us from trauma. And adolescents, as, as um, folks have mentioned, have 
a particularly strong, healthy need to connect with their peers. And the pandemic is super in interfered with this. So we need to prioritize giving them plenty of opportunities to spend time with friends and other loved ones. And we can also help young people cultivate a habit of being kind and helpful to others. This is healing because altruistic acts light up the same pleasure centers in our brain as really good food and positive emotions like compassion fill our bodies with healthy neurochemicals that actively combat the toxicity of chronic stress. Moving to our empowerment and collaboration principle, research demonstrates that we have a sense of, that just having a sense of agency in our lives can make us healthier and happier and more productive. And we know from science that even having perceived control over our stressors mitigates the effect of toxic stress. So whenever it's possible, we need to let our young people have a voice around issues that affect them and offer them choices about thing that, things that matter to them. And also scaffolding kids to engage in activities that give them a sense of agency and purpose can really promote resilience. So like engaging in acts of social justice or in actions that help others can be so healing. And moving into our last principle, resilience and social emotional wellness, we as adults can promote resilience in our young people by building their social emotional skills like self-awareness and self-management and relationship skills. We can do this by modeling these skills with our own behavior and by teaching them through culturally responsive social emotional learning curricula. Finally, I think it's really crucial that we promote post-traumatic growth in our young people and moving away from talking about last year as and a half, like as lost time, and instead helping them shape a narrative for themselves about the ways that they're overcoming adversities that they've been up against. And that by doing so, they're actually learning a lot and becoming stronger, wiser, and more compassionate human beings. So that's what I've, I've got for now. And thanks so much for the opportunity. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you so many amazing tips for parents. I'd like to now welcome Julie. I'm just filled with gratitude to get to be a part of this conversation. Let me start there. I'm doing that intentionally because having a gratitude practice makes what I have enough. If you don't have a gratitude practice, think about reading up on that. When we're able to express gratitude for simply what we have right now, it makes what we have enough. I am, in fact, actually quite grateful to be with the UCSF community today. I'm down here in Palo Alto, affiliated with a different institution, but um, obviously have massive respect for UCSF and really honored to be on the, on the panel today. I wanna thank Alyssa and John and Sunya and Joyce and Dan. I'm a little old school. I don't use slides. I'm just gonna try to connect heart to heart here with you today. You came here for a reason. I can't possibly know what it is, but I hope there will be something in what I say that touches you and makes you go, yeah, she was talking to me. I'm here as an author, yes, but I'm also here as a mom. I have a 22-year-old son, blows my mind to say that, 22-year-old Sawyer and a 20-year-old daughter, Avery. They both just had their birthdays. I am no longer the parent of teenagers which blows my mind. And um, I think I might be here more in my capacity as a mom, to be frank. I want you to think back on when you were first cognizant of this thing, this thing, this virus, this COVID-19, this coronavirus. I invite you to go back in your memory to when it was new. Maybe you travel a lot and you were starting to pay attention to some news in the regions in which you were headed. Or maybe you have some health situations, some pre-existing health situations that make you always scan the news, the radar for things that might be a threat to you. Maybe you were just reading the newspaper and you were seeing, oh, there's something coming. Think back, it was likely January, February, March, 2020. Do you remember when we thought it would be two weeks that we would have to shelter in place or wear masks or change up our lives or two weeks. And we were flipping out about all that we could not do in those two weeks. How will we endure? And I remember myself in March of 2020 when I would hear people say, it's gonna be like this until we can get a vaccine. I thought, I can't wait until we have a vaccine. A year, 
I said to myself, and now, of course, <laughs> now, of course, boy, did that time fly. And yet it felt like we were walking through mud, schools, workplace, family life, everything has shifted. And I'm here to say, and it's not the most pleasant thing to say, but I'm a realist and an optimist. So I'm going to say we are in the eye of this storm still. I'm trying to be real about that. We do not know the size or the scope. We do not know the end date as we once might have thought we would back in March of 2020. Y'all, this is simply our latest reminder as humans that most of life is not within our control and that all we can really be in charge of if we work hard at it is ourselves. And even when we are fully in charge, we get reminders that we're not completely in charge. On Mother's Day, when my children were young, we used to go to Half Moon Bay, to Pomponio Beach or San Gregorio, some of you know it, because I like to build sand castles. And that was my Mother's Day request. Can we drive to the beach? Let me put my hands in the sand. Let me construct a beautiful structure with waterways for leaves to travel along. And I was in charge, it was my own little village, but a wave could come. But I knew to expect waves, what I didn't know to expect were the toddlers who would walk by and swing at my creations with their little plastic shovels, toddlers not belonging to me, but belonging to the family down the beach a little ways. This pandemic is in some ways simply yet another reminder that so much is out of our control. I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm actually gonna offer you what is within our control. I wanna posit here that how we can best support our youth in this ongoing enduring moment is to work hard at regulating ourselves, taking care of business within ourselves so that we can offer a more loving, safe environment, experience, life for our children. I'm delighted to hear of Sunya's authentic connection groups. They resonate with me big time. I love that there's research-based evidence that those things are essential and are working. Have a space and a place where you can talk with other grown-ups about the that is going on. Yes, be real with your partner, with your peers, and try not to burden your kids with the utter direness that is very real and very much swimming within you. I want to offer that we need to show up for our kids with the realism, but also the optimism. Okay, they need facts, but they also need our optimism. The adults whose eyes are the first they ever saw, they need to look into our eyes and see strength and optimism. Okay, so as we're regulating ourselves and getting the support we need, then we can show up with our kids Try to imagine our ancestors. Many of us come from people who endured worse than this, y'all. Summon your memory of your ancestors in Auschwitz. Summon your memory of your ancestors in internment camps, enslaved, okay? Summon the memory of the strong people you are from and imagine how they spoke with their children to help their children see that the sun will still come up tomorrow. Our children are looking to our faces for evidence that things are going to be okay. Number two, I want to offer, in addition to the optimism, I want to offer clarity is important about rules and expectations. My husband and I made the mistake of being very wishy-washy with our kids over the last year. Can we do this? Well, we're not really sure. We need to think. Do your thinking offline behind closed doors with your partner or with whomever you're raising kids so that you can say to your kids, I'm not sure. We haven't figured that out yet. We'll get back to you as opposed to letting them see you dither and be wishy-washy. We were wishy-washy and I regret it. Um, they need to see our clarity. They need the boundaries identified and articulated by us. Number three, they need rituals, family meals, um, something you just always do. My 22-year-old son loves the fact that we have a cuddling couch nighttime thing. We just watch shows that we love together, and we connect our bodies and touch I was stunned to see my 21 and now 22 year old son craving that, but he is home with us and needs that. And um, we wanna be sure we're showing up 
in these emotional bodily ways and the ways our kids need. Number four, their feelings matter. Instead of stepping in and swooping in to solve their problems, sit back, empathize, and empower. Let them have their feelings. Be an active listener who says, yeah, tell me more. It sounds like that's hard. I am here. Don't be afraid of their feelings. Let them have their feelings. This is an important thing that we as grownups have to do. I'm over time. I'm just going to quickly lay out two more quick things. Actually, I won't. I want to respect the time. I've said enough. I'll end with this. We don't know how long this will last. Will it end or is this the new normal? God help us. Stay present. Things will be messed up at school and at work, but believe it or not, you can be in charge of how you show up and the environment you create in your home if you work hard at it. I believe you can. I'm working hard on it myself. Thank you. I'm going to say authenticity and passion are present with us and keywords for today. Thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to turn to Dan, Dan, to offer any comments and your own comments, and then Dan and I will moderate discussion. Thank you, Alyssa, and thank you, um, all of you, for being here. Um, it's my honor to be um, uh, building some bridges among the three wonderful presentations you just had. So I will just highlight some of the key points and then try to draw some uh, connecting practical suggestions for all of us. Um, Sonia has really done some fantastic work with the idea that it's better together, that finding these authentic ways of connecting, these authentic groups that you've studied, uh, really tells us that when we have this thing called social distancing, which is a phrase we should ban from our public lives as well as professional lives, it should be physical distancing while maintaining social connection. And those authentic connections are a deep source of resilience, uh, which is not a personality trait, as you've so powerfully said. And what that means for us is that as care providers, whether we're talking about being professionals, uh, as teachers, or as clinicians, or as parents ourselves, we really need to take care of our own inner life to build that resilience for ourselves so that when our youth are looking to us for guidance, they hear the tone of our voice, they see the expression on our face, they see the pauses between what we say. And if we haven't done the, our own inner work, uh, then it will fall short of inspiring them to find their own resilience. So. We'll come back to those authentic connections in, in just a moment. Joyce, you've really beautifully reminded us that we need to be informed about how the body responds to overwhelming experiences called trauma and to look at how we can support youth in finding a way from reactive states uh, where we're, we could be fighting, fleeing, freezing, or fainting even when we feel totally helpless and collapsed and it really is an invitation when we think about this trauma-informed perspective to build on what not only Sonia was saying, but also, uh, Julie, what you were saying, that these are what journalists and the military originally coined as VUCA times, V-U-C-A. They're volatile, meaning they change very quickly. They're uncertain, meaning we don't know what's going to happen. They're complex meaning even if we had the time to study all the details and get all the data, the intricate nonlinear ways things influence each other, that's what complexity is, would make it almost impossible to predict what's going on. And then A of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, is ambiguous, meaning even if we see it all in front of us, we don't know how to interpret what the data mean. So VUCA times elicit what Joyce is saying, this reactive state instead of a receptive state. And if we understand the brain mechanisms of that, that means that instead of the social engagement system that Steve Porges has beautifully written about being turned on, instead it gets turned off and we distance ourselves, even if we don't intend to, in an attempt to protect ourselves. So a trauma state can, in this way that Joyce, you've powerfully invited us to reflect on, have these grooves set up in our brain, making more likely we go into reactivity. And we need to realize that youth may be experiencing that even more because they're looking for some kind of solidity, not a VUCA experience. 
And this comes to Julie, what you're really uh, in uh, very deep ways inviting us to think about was that we need to, and this builds on the other two presentations as well, we really need to go into a state of gratitude and have um, the inner resources to make sure we're keeping hope alive. You know, Brian Stevenson was mentioned, um, he wrote the book, Just Mercy, and he has a very powerful statement, which is that a helplessness and hopelessness are very important to look at because hopelessness is the enemy of justice. And part of what we do as you know, professionals in the healing arts is to try to bring this sense of hope and to bring justice so everyone can experience well-being across our social complexities. We also have this moment as parents of how do we keep hope alive for our kids. So what I'd like to do in building on these three presentations is give you a very um, quick summary of, if you will, the science of hope so that instead of having hopelessness be the enemy of justice, the, the corollary of that is keeping hope alive is actually the steward of justice. And I'll have you consider it's a steward of resilience. So let me go through several factors that when you look at the research on hope, they fall together and I'm, I have an acronym addiction, so please um, excuse me, but this one spells the word grasp and I think hope is within our grasp. The first is G, and you can use the word goal, which is what I uh, intended with this acronym, but you could also put in gratitude there if you want. Um, the idea of the goal is that we together can say these are VUCA times. We may have a narrative that many of our pres presenters mentioned, a narrative that says, I wanna be certain things should work out fine, everything should be good, there's no virus. But the story that's true is that these are VUCA times. And whether you're looking at social injustice or you're looking at the climate crisis, these VUCA times are probably gonna be with us for the rest of our lives. And hopefully there'll be some stability for the next generation, but possibly not. This may be a new way of living. So if we have a narrative that says it should not be that way, I don't want it to be this way, oh, I can't handle this, that's gonna create its own stress. So the first stage of a goal is to have this kind of gratitude that I can learn to live with this sense of hope that we can together make it through VUCA times and do whatever we can to reduce social injustice, to reduce the climate factors that are destroying other species and, and destroying our environment. And that we can have that shared goal. That's the G. The R is to have reflection. That as Alyssa and I have done in other parts of this series and other series related to UC San Francisco and the alum, alum group, um, to really do the reflective work to build your resilience. That the research is very clear. If you strengthen your attention, if you open your awareness and build the kindness that many of our presenters have talked about, the research is clear. You can actually build the networks of resilience that allow you to face challenges in a very different way. And the five factors of physiological well-being that uh, Alyssa beautifully wrote um, with Elizabeth Blackburn in her book, The Telomere Effect, you can see are reducing stress, improving immune function, improving cardiovascular function, changing epigenetic controls to reduce inflammation, which is a cause, as you know, of serious life-threatening disease, and also to optimize telomerase levels to repair and maintain the ends of the chromosomes. So these practices you can do with your mind in terms of the R of grasp are things that can actually help your body become more resilient. And as you bring that to your children, they will see that in you. You are not helpless and you can be hopeful. So that's GR. The A is agency. Even doing the internal practice of these three pillar practice is something you can do every day for free. You don't have to go anywhere. You can start doing that just like you take a deep breath and pause as Joyce showed us. You can do these practices. Building the resilience for yourself allows you to have a sense of agency rather than helplessness and hopelessness. So G-R-A-S, what's the P? The P is purpose. 
and having a plan with a purposeful project. For example, after today's hour that we've spent together, you can come away from this, from each of our presenters and say, I am now gonna do something. I am not hopeless, I am not helpless. I can be, as Julie beautifully said, you know, a realistic optimist. And an optimist, not someone who just thinks it's gonna be great outcome when it's not, but actually looking for the positive and constructing a story that is flexible and fluid and what we call coherent, so that you actually can start from the inside out, as Sunya has asked us to do, that whatever the trauma is Joyce has asked us to focus on is presenting us with, we now do this together and we have a project where we together can grasp hope, keep hope alive in our lives and move into these VUCA times, not with blindfolds, but eyes wide open, heart open to the world and able to connect with each other. This is something that together we can accomplish and we can do with strength, and efficacy. And that's how we can grasp into a more positive approach to the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just blown away by all of you and together, all of you. So please let's all um, come to um, turn our screens on and we can actually have some dialogue about this. I'm just so um, moved that Julie took us to the context that is just, we just can't ignore. You know, it's not just about schools and what they'll be like with, you know, Delta and maybe Lambda. I mean, there's all these looming threats, but it really is the massive uncertainty that is indefinite. And how do we, you know, hope is about, you have a vision that the future is better than the present. And we know that that's not the case with climate. And we know there's a lot of uncertainty, as you said, through our lifetime. So, so then this hope is so important, but effortful. And we need role models and we need contagious hope. So I'm so glad, Dan, that you um, focused us on hope and grasp, because I think that is our lifeline for ourselves and for our parenting. So I would love to... Um, to open it up to you to also uh, talk to each other and ask each other questions. And I think my first question is really just, given that the, the news is not going to be good and, and it's very threatening to talk about climate a lot, but we, but we need to be having this, these conversations. We, need, we can't shield our children from everything that's happening. So, what does this look like at home? What is our best future given the unstable world? The part we can control. Mm. The dinner may, table, et cetera, the, the view. May I say something really quickly? I was too past uh, building on what uh, Diane said so beautifully. So the hope is wonderful. The thing that troubles or worries me is our, uh, well, frankly, anger that has built up in society and is ripe in our families, in, uh, in, in society, in our schools, it's just below the surface. So I think we're going to need to acknowledge that it's there. And Julie, you were so humble in saying, you're chiding yourself as a parent. I wish I'd been more deliberate or less, so oh, I don't know, the word you use with your, with your husband. But the fact is we were all thrown as much as anybody was. So some compassion at giving ourselves that grace and saying, I did, I may have messed up, and I'm saying that about myself too as a mother of two grown children. I'm sure I did. But the reality is, I love them. The reality is, we'll talk about it and process it and move on with that hope that uh, back to what Joyce was saying, humanity has been traumatized, and that includes us, those of us who are used to doing what Dan says, the healing arts. So, so nasty. So just being watchful of this monster that's lurking, that, which is anger. Not fearfulness, not depression, but anger. I so appreciate that, um, Sunya. Thank you for saying that. I I want to clarify that I offered that not to be chastising myself, but I think it's important to do real talk. I think it's important to look back and say, you know what? As I look back, 
um, I realized I didn't handle that the way I now would, given the experience I've had. And it's a way for me to sort of lay down some new patterns. Like I can chart my own growth. I can say a year ago, I was wishy-washy with my kids because my fear, because the uncertainty, because I didn't want to be the mean parent that said, you can't do this. All of those things were going on. And I've I'm actually proud of the fact that I can sit here now and say, okay, I've learned a lot since then. This pandemic has taught me some things, some new skills and new tools. So that's what I was trying to demonstrate. Uh, not, not, not interested in self-flagellation or any one of us feeling guilty about what we can do, but I am interested in us all taking the lessons from the life we've led. Yeah, I feel like that, that what you just said it encompasses both the grace and the ability to reflect. Like when we can reflect, then that allows us to, to learn. And when we can extend grace to ourselves, that actually gives us the headspace to be able to reflect instead of just shutting it down and saying, oh, I'm bad, I'm just not going to think about it. Right. So, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Julie, you're, you're right. And I didn't mean to go as far as saying self flagellation, but one of the things I often said is guilt is a universal experience of motherhood. If you're a mom, at some point, you're going to feel guilty about something, right? And the, the, we have all been stretched so thin. And truthfully, I myself do say, I wish I could have done things differently there. But I was at this, at this peak, at this peak, there's really nothing more to give, as that one uh, teacher said. So it's not, it's not about blaming oneself, but it is about recognizing we are human beings and we need to be held and embraced and loved every bit as much as we want to give that embracing and loving right. and holding to our children, right? And just to build on that, you know, those uh, rates of burnout that you indicated yeah. is really, I think, worth us each reflecting on and you know, what it takes to take a pause and to then, you know, recalibrate and be aware of your burnout, um, to take the time to then regenerate the kind of passion and energy that you had to go into the field that you're in. Um, and, you know, part of, I think, overall, what we're talking about, and I think, Alyssa, in, you've done research in this, you know, is the meaning that people find in life really makes a difference. So if, you, if you're experiencing the pandemic as uh, I'm, this is just a meaningless assault on the predictable life that I think I should have and I don't have and there's nothing I can extract from this that's called meaning making, you're gonna be, you're gonna burn out. So, you know, I don't know if, unless you wanna comment on the, the idea of resilience, burnout, trauma and meaning, it's a big topic, but it feels like that's kind of what we're all inviting everyone, you know, who's here today in the conversation to say, how do we make meaning out of these really challenging times that are probably gonna stay with us for decades? I mean, I'm just gonna say it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this isn't just, oh, I need a, a Band-Aid for the next six months. It's a, it's a new, new way humanity needs to live, at least the way we've expected it here in, in uh, modernity. This brings us to a question that uh, hundreds of parents listening have. Their child may be concerned about academics and performance and worried about COVID and struggling emotionally. Many parents are worried about their child's lot, you know, learning losses and, and academics. And so there's a, there, there's a bounce that parents are looking for. And so what I would love to hear is some words of advice on how to take the pressure off kids, do you completely shift away from an academic focus and more on social you know, resilience and survival. I mean, this is a remarkable transition for children and families and parents to be making. And I think what I'm, you know, what I'm hearing from you, Dan, and all of you is that this larger shift toward viewing our purpose in life and our, you know, what that, that, that that's going to be very helpful for, for our keeping hope and for reducing stress in our youth. So what does that mean? You know, it used to be okay to just focus on academics and everything felt stable. And now that feels like a quite, quite a misstep. So mm -hmm. any comments on that? I can give you some data. Oh, just yesterday, I looked at 
answer to this question. I have trouble. Oh, I'm. Uh, I can. I can learn new materials at school. And the percentage of kids who said not at all well is ha was higher, obviously, when you know, in April of uh, last year. But this whole academic year has stayed pretty much constant between somewhere between 13 and 15 percent. So it does not show that spike that we see in internalizing problems. Bottom line is they will learn what we will make up a year at some point. We cannot take a chance of having our kids get to that level of serious, serious uh, depression, anxiety, whatever that is. So personally, that's my, I don't, I'd love to hear what the rest of you think. I don't know what the data say. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I think you said it used to be okay to just focus on academics and that was fine. And I was like, no, it was not fine when we were just obsessed with academics. We, as Sunya knows better than most, you know, there, there has been a toll taken um, with that approach. And I think the pandemic offers a beautiful opportunity to reset around, um, you know, what it is that actually does promote wellness and learning. Um, Challenge Success is an organization here on the peninsula um, that I used to be on the board of, and they just had a lovely newsletter come out today reminding parents about um, uh, the sorts of things that matter as we approach a new school year. That's sleep. Let's, you know, we kids got more sleep during the pandemic. Let's, let's hold on to that because sleep is such an important uh, contributor to their wellness. Let's not stack up with activities, even if everything opens, um, because they need a little bit more downtime and they need a little bit more family time. So um, this is another way in which the pandemic is actually teaching us what matters most. And I think our the question is, do we dare to to let it teach us these important lessons, or are we going to try to return to an old normal that was in many ways um, unhealthy for kids? Yeah, that's, I'm so glad you said that, Julie. And just being having the privilege of being able to work with educators and watching how they're preparing for this year, the, the, the folks that, the educators we work with really get it. Um, I just got off a meeting where, where folks were saying, we're gonna spend the first few weeks, there's gonna be no books. We're just gonna focus on creating our community, on really helping kids feel seen and heard, creating that sense of belonging. And then we're gonna bring in the books and we're gonna continue to hold high expectations in terms of trying to get folks to grade level, but, but without that foundation, right, of wellness and continuing that, even once we bring the books out, we're, we're gonna be lost. So the educators that, that we work with really get it. And I'm, I'm, so, I'm so impressed with what they're doing. Do you have any advice for teachers and parents who, who can talk to teachers about how to have a soft landing, how to help be Toronto informed, you know, in those first days, in the first month? And it just strikes me that, you know, the focus, um, you know, how, how, to, how to fit in the focus of pro-social values and whether it's climate or systemic racism, like, is that rising to the, you know, to the top in terms of curriculum? Because I think that's one of the best ways to create meaning for kids, to be addressing a cur the current issues and not um, just the, what's, you know, required of their grade level. Yes, absolutely. Folks are really leaning into like what's happening now and what do we learn from what's happening now? And with the racial justice uprising, for example, just really not just ignoring that that happened is, is really important. And I think folks are leaning into that. And, and, and Joyce, to build on that and build on what you said earlier about post-traumatic growth, you know, uh, I think each of us, Julie and Sonia too, and, and Alyssa, maybe you're, you're asking this in the question, if we can find meaning in these challenges and uh, really find a way to go from these reactive states that, that Joyce started us out with to um, then looking at how do I build the ability to monitor what's going on and then to modify it. So it isn't just being aware of what's happening. It's actually, I'm aware I'm in a reactive state and now I've learned the tools which are available to bring myself to a receptive state. So if in schools, they say, we're gonna strengthen the mind, the mind is a, a, both an embodied and a relational process that is a regulatory process, meaning 
it monitors and it modifies towards something we can simply call integration. But the bottom line is there are steps educators can do to have children learn to strengthen their minds in the face of a challenge, which is a, you know, an aspect of resilience. And so they don't have to be passive about it. Does it mean academics will be on pause? It's a new three R's. It's not just reading, writing, arithmetic, which are important. It's the ability to reflect, which is like to monitor, to develop resilience, which is to modify, and to build on your relationships. That this is, this is you know, if anything, the pandemic has taught us that it's better together, that we are a we, you know, we are a collective. That's who we are. We can't go on thinking we're just solo selves living in isolation. And whether it's about social injustice or it's about the climate crisis, you know, this is a moment where this virus can be inviting us to change how we live on the planet in a positive direction. And we really can become empowered. Uh, I just finished reading this book that'll be out in a few months called Regeneration. And it's a beautiful example from Paul Hawken and his colleagues, you know, of what we can all do on all these spheres to make a better world in one generation. So this is something we can do. And it's just saying, what is it we can do so we can be empowered to do it? And, you know, if schools aren't doing that, what's the point of doing anything? Mm. So beautiful, Dan. Thank you so much. The, um, the focus on achievement and materialism and capitalism, you know, they really do, um, they do become addictive and there's a lot of pressure toward those. And I think when we talk about what's the new view of hope, we're gonna live in a less hospitable climate, we're gonna have challenges. And so there's only one answer, which is to build a more beautiful pro-social climate. And, the, and what all of you do focusing on children and youth, there couldn't be more important work or focus. They are our future and we need to do our best to uh, foster their resilience, to protect them when we can. And you've given us so many wonderful tips. I'd just like to end with a, any last comment or words from each of you. And I also will point people to our website. We have really wonderful resources and people are, have beautiful questions in the chat. So I hope some of those will be addressed by the resources. And uh, for example, GRASP, the, the acronym uh, will be posted there as well as some other answers. Okay, so let's um, close up here. So, Sonia, any last comments or advice? I am beyond grateful to you all for doing this. And it is something that's on somebody said in the comments, let's take this on the road. Julie. I would just say that I've been transparent with my kids who are older um, about the fact that I'm doing my own work. I don't try to burden them with all the stuff I'm dealing with. But when I do find my own anxiety creeping up and creeping into family interactions, I, with my mindfulness practice, will notice it. And I'll say to my kids, you know what? I'm really anxious about this. I'm working on this. Please know it has nothing to do with you. I have found that to be the most magical, beautiful reset. They give me, they extend all the grace to like, you know, no worries, mom. We, I love you. And I, I get... You know, it, it's been a way for me to try not to pass my anxiety onto my kids, um, to just acknowledge that it exists and that it has nothing to do with them. So for anyone who needs to hear that, that's for you. Absolutely beautiful. Joyce. Um, I guess I would just say trauma fragments our brains and our bodies and our relationships and our organizations. And so moving towards integration, as Dan has said, through reflection, through meaning making, through connection and love, that's really where it's at. So I Thank you so much for saying all of those things. Thank you, Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, one last comment by Dan, and then we'll thank say you. goodbye. J just, just the simple thank you to you all, and thank you to everyone. You know, together we can do this. And thank you, Alyssa, for inviting us. And this has been a beautiful uh, connection for, with everyone. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Appreciate you spent your time with us. Thank you.